I'm Richard Cohen, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Jewish Historical Society of Western Massachusetts. And it's my great pleasure to interview Alon Stavins today on behalf of the Historical Society, today being May 27, 2021. I'm Alon is Lewis Sebring Professor of Humanities and Latin American and Latino Culture at Amherst College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Alon is a prolific and acclaimed writer and scholar. And to repeat his curriculum vita, I would take up probably most of the time in this interview. So I'll just give a few highlights. Alon has written collection of poetry, collection of short stories, a play, uh, scholarly works on the subject of language, linguistics, and Latin American uh, literature, in particular Octavio Paz, Borges, and Neruda. Uh, he has edited a number of anthologies, including anthologies on Latin American literature and also Jewish literature. And uh, he is the founder, co-founder of the Great Books Day Camp and is academic director, I believe, and also is a co-founder of Restless Books, which is um, a publishing house focused on international literature as well as the immigrant experience. He's a frequent presence on New England Public Radio. He's recipient of a number of awards, including Guggenheim Fellowship and Chile's Presidential Medal. So again, I, I really appreciate your making time for this interview, Alon, and welcome. Pleasure, pleasure to be with you, Richard. In the interest of full disclosure, I have to mention that over the past several years, I have taken some of Alon, audited some of Alon's courses at Amherst College, and I can personally attest to his extraordinary teaching skills. So Alana, I'd like to start with some background. I'd like to delve into some family history. As I understand it, your family came to Mexico from uh, Eastern Europe. And I would appreciate if you could tell us a little bit about that journey. It, again, the pleasure is mine, Richard, and it has uh, gone for uh, many years that we know each other and uh, I, I take uh, with happiness this opportunity of talking about genealogy with you. Um, I am the grandchild of the uh, Eastern European Jews that arrived to Mexico in the 1920s at different moments depending on the grandparent. Uh, they originally were from the Pale of Settlement uh, that the part of Eastern Europe where Jews were allowed to settle uh, for centuries. Um, and they were Yiddish speakers. Some of them were from Poland, uh, others from uh, Belarus. Uh, and uh, depending on which moment in, in history, they might have, they, they were in territories that might have changed na uh, nationalities. Um, they were all uh, shtetl dwellers, uh, except for my maternal grandmother, who came from um, a, a nearby town to Warsaw, that is today a suburb of the Polish capital, but at that time was kind of distant from the center. Uh, the reason why they immigrated um, has to do with uh, what we usually refer to as the anti-Semitic outbursts, uh, pogroms. Uh, they were generally of a poor backgrounds and the expectations for them uh, were limited in terms of social mobility. There had begun to be a um, attacks or harassment uh, from the very end of the 19th century to 
the early decade of the 20th century. And uh, I'll just conclude this part by saying that uh, taking one family of the four, my again, my maternal grandmother, uh, out of 12 children, um, she, she was one of those of 12, it, it, 10 died in the Holocaust. So not having left would have been a, even more dire than the, the prospect of uh, taking up their things and, and uprooting themselves. And can you tell me how they came to Mexico as opposed to the US? Were there were the immigration laws in the US too stringent? Uh, how, how did it happen they ended up in Mexico? I, I know of a, two of them in more detail than I know about the other two because my, both my uh, grandfathers died when I was young and uh, the information that came to me from my uh, different relatives about them is more limited than the, what I was able to ask each of my grandmothers. They both li lived until their uh, 90s. And uh, I, before immigrating to the United States in the mid 80s, spent time with them in, and curiously asked them about uh, how they had made it to Mexico. What I know is that um, all of them in one way or another had uh, imagined the possibility of joining relatives that had made it to the United States prior to them. Um, and there was also the line of going to Argentina uh, that was also a magnet for Jewish immigrants in the part of uh, Poland where my grandmother was from, uh, my maternal grandmother. Uh, the immigration quotas to the United States made it difficult depending on the year. And in at least one case, the decision was straight to go to uh, the Spanish speaking world. One of them ended up in the Caribbean, then moved around uh, and eventually settled in Mexico. The others went directly to Mexico. Uh, this created in us uh, their descendants, which are the, the feeling that the, the door they really wanted open was the door of the North in that uh, we were either temporarily in Mexico or in Mexico because we couldn't be in the United States. Mm. Interesting. I, I, I understand that your grandmother wrote an autobiography, is, is that correct? My grandmother on my, again, on my father's side, uh, Bella, Bella uh, Stavchansky. Uh, Stavchansky was the last, uh, my, her, her married uh, name, a uh, last name. She, when I was beginning to write an autobiography of my own called On Borrowed Words that I published in, in 2001, um, I, uh, I was in touch with her and she was a very commanding, uh, even tyrannical uh, mm -hmm. woman. And she said to me, Ilan, if you're gonna write about me in any way, I'm gonna tell you what I want you to say. And she sat down and uh, had my mother type a memoir that she put together. Uh, it was about 40 pages, single spaced, uh, all of them in capitals. You, you, can, you can imagine how clear the message she wanted me to hear. And she gave it to me and she gave it to others as well. Right, right. It's, it's uh, quite a gift to have that kind of family memoir that you can look back to because it can so easily be lost over the generations. There's stories that are told, but if there isn't anything in writing or video, it can easily be lost and forgotten by the family. It, it was an extraordinary document, though as all autobiographies, Richard, it was uh, constructed in such a way to make her look uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that uh, that was that was good to her. There was a section in my there is a section in my own autobiography where I quote my father telling my grandmother that she didn't come exactly from the type of rabbinical niche that she kept on saying. And she said, "Well, that's really let's not discuss that right now." <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I want to ask you now about your experience growing up in Mexico, I believe Mexico City. Yes. Um, and something you mentioned uh, struck me, which is it sounds like your family uh, perhaps felt that it was somewhat transient, that, that living in Mexico was just a temporary thing, that eventually you would be moving to the US or, or more permanent location. And I'm interested in, in how, whether that was communicated to you, if it was, how that might have influenced your own experience in Mexico. Yes. Um, I, I grew up in a, a middle-class family. Um, maybe it would be more accurate to describe it as lower middle class, but it is uh, just because in certain periods, my father was an actor and in certain periods, uh, acting was, uh, he didn't get much work. So there wasn't much of an income that was coming in. My father also, uh, because of the juncture of the different uh, family uh, members, the history of the very different family members, ended up inheriting um, a factory that my that his father my my father my grandfather had started factory sounds like a like a very sophisticated word word for really a, a a provider of animal food for certain neighborhoods in mexico and my his father my grandfather was not a good businessman um, so by the time he died of cancer in his 50s the the factory was virgin bankruptcy and my father it turned out to be even less apt for the for the business uh, endeavors so there was always this uh, instability um, i did uh, receive that sense of we are in mexico we are a, a diaspora jews that uh, arrived here in more by accident than a, any decisive reason. And a, our presence in Mexico is therefore a, a kind of a, a product of a, of a lottery in history, um, which translated to me, Richard, as a, as a feeling of a, both gratitude for the way Mexico had opened the doors to my grandparents in a sense that I was there uh, on a temporary basis, I, as I describe it in the autobiography of Borrowed Words, more in a rented home than in an owned uh, home, uh, and that at some point something could happen in Mexico that wasn't too different from what had happened in Belarus or in Poland that would push us to the next diaspora. The idea that uh, eventually I and others would continue, would, would move on either to the United States. I am of a generation where some went to study to the United States in different universities and colleges. I did not, or to Israel in particular, where the Aliyot in the 1960s and 70s were very intense because of the uh, dictatorships and political uh, strife that was taking place in the region. Uh, so it was it was always the idea that we needed to be prepared with languages, with with the dexterous capacities to adapt to different realities. Uh, and the result was that we were all Mexican, but felt a tenuous uh, relationship with the country. Uh, both rooted there because we were, had been born in it, but also, in, you know, kind of loof mentioned in some sense. Did, did you feel that you had a, a strong Jewish identity as you were growing up in Mexico? And if, if so, what was the basis for that? Was Jewish education, family, uh, family passing on traditions? Uh, Yes, I, I, I think now, and I thought then that uh, being Jewish was uh, the most decisive aspect of my education. I uh, communicated 
in Yiddish with my grandparents and also with my parents, although at some point with my parents we switched. Yiddish was the language of the, of the enclave of Ashkenazi Jews. I was sent from a very early age to kindergarten and then to a private Jewish schools where it wasn't religion that mattered. It was really the Yiddish culture that we had inherited. And so it was a Buddhist, secular, a politicized, but politicized in the same of, in the sense of the Yiddishists, that Yiddish was a kind of conviction in, in defining factor in our lives. Um, we, we were not uh, a practicing family. Uh, there were the Shabbat uh, candles at home. Uh, we always went to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the high holidays uh, in school. We were all aware of the other holidays, but uh, the house was not kosher. The, there, there were other elements also that had more to do with the sense that what was passing onto us was Jewish culture, uh, much more than the Jewish religion. Right. And, and it, that <clears throat> defined me um, profoundly, uh, Richard. And I, with with even with the ambivalence, because I remember thinking that my parents had done a disservice to me and my, and my siblings, uh, and so did the other, so had the other parents uh, of friends that I had, that I moved around in, uh, in teaching us Yiddish, because Yiddish, it was clear, was a dying language. The Holocaust had decimated it. There wasn't any practical side for knowing Yiddish. And so I felt, why am I not being taught uh, English or French or, or German or something different, even German? Um, but uh, it was only when I left Mexico and came to the United States, having tried before that to make Aliyah and, 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 and live in Israel, that I realized that Yiddish was uh, something that my parents and ancestors gave me that uh, was I could not do without. Hmm. Do, do you have any connection now with the National uh, Jewish, uh, the National Yiddish uh, Book Center? In, in I, do. I do, a strong one. I was on the board for uh, years and uh, I, I, uh, I worked together with them. I feel very close. And it's one of the reasons why uh, I moved with my family to this area because of how this institution was really a, a, a force I felt attached to. Uh, yeah, I, I think I share your ambivalence toward, toward Yiddish in the sense that it, you know, as Aaron Lansky says in, in, uh, in, in his book, um, it's an important part of Jewish history Jewish culture, Jewish identity. Uh, on the other hand, it, it is, I, I, I guess it is a language that's being resurrected to some extent, but it's not really a, a spoken language, day-to-day -day kind of spoken language. Yeah. But it was it was obviously so much a part of, of the European experience of, of Jews. And I, so my Maybe. parents knew a little bit from their parents, but it became uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit less diluted, as it were, as as time went along. Um, yeah. Did you learn Hebrew as well, though? In, in the I did. Um, I, I just want to. I wanted to add to that that though it's true that Yiddish is no longer a, a you know, a fully active language right. um, among the Orthodox. It is Lubavitchers and others in New York and in right. LA and in, in, in Israel, it is still um, a, a form of communication, a glue that keeps right. the community together. And it's a somewhat um, kind of cool topic on campus in certain places, but the number is so, so right. campus is nationwide, but the numbers are really minuscule, not to say insignificant. There is a moment very precise uh, Richard, that I can remember 
uh, when the, the letters and letter guests, that is the teachers, male and female, uh, that were uh, in charge of uh, passing on the Yiddish to us, both the language and the culture. Um, some of them have been through the Holocaust, others were immigrants like uh, my grandparents, were dying or retiring in the 60s and 70s. And the Mexican Jewish community, uh, the Ashkenazi side, because there's another side that it's the kind of Lebanese Ottoman from Levant, um, needed, to, needed to respond to this uh, demographic change that was taking place. Uh, there was not yet an, a, a, a vigorous, in, it, it turns out that there, will, there would never be a replacement for them, that is younger Yiddish speakers that offered to be teachers or, or having other uh, both pedagogical and administrative jobs. And uh, that coincided with the rise of uh, a Zionist endeavor in the, just before, well, I would say around the, the Yom Kippur War, 73, in throughout the 70s of beginning to send to the various Jewish communities, shlichim, that is envoys that would uh, create deeper connections between the emergent Jewish state and Hebrew. And uh, so I, what happened in Mexico and happened in other communities in Latin America in, in, and in Australia and in Canada, but to, to different degrees was that it, the Yiddish teachers were replaced by Hebrew teachers. Mm. In, in, and that created a, a schism, a dramatic shift, because we were still being taught a, a Jewish language, but it, now it was a, a national language. It was a language of power rather than a language of dispossession that as Yiddish had been. And, uh, and it came with a whole ideological baggage of if you're going to learn Hebrew, you should imagine yourself making aliyah at some point and uh, becoming a useful Jew in the, in, in the second half of the 20th century. So I belong to that generation of, of, of transition where Yiddish had been a, kind of injected into us. We reached our teens and the teachers uh, were, were kind of being eclipsed by this other group that was coming from Israel. And even in the names of younger Mexican Jews, you see the difference between certain names, the Yiddish names that had come before and then the Hebrew names of people. Um, I have a Hebrew name and my parents were kind of ahead of the wave. Uh, my sister is also has a Hebrew Israeli name, not a biblical name um, and that, that is also, that, that shows that kind of a uh, transition that was happening. Hebrew became uh, an important language for me. I eventually, when I reached uh, age 18, decided to uh, not go to college and instead spend a year in Israel um, and with the idea that maybe I would move to Israel in order to cure the division that existed in me between being Mexican and being Jewish and lived in Israel at that time and studied and did all sorts of things. So Yiddish, Yiddish became a kind of second aspect in Hebrew, a more frontal one. I, I want to return to Israel, but, but first, if we could just sure. go back to Mexico City for a little bit. I'm, did you feel welcome in in? Mexico, did you feel like you were an outsider? Um, was, was there much anti-Semitism? Uh, did, did Jews seem to have uh, equal opportunities? How, how, did, how, yeah. did, uh, how did that work? I felt very welcome in Mexico by Mexicans. Um, but I need to qualify this statement, Richard, because um, Mexico is a very stratified society where race and class play an important role. 
And the whiter your skin and more Europeanized your ancestry, the likelier you are to ascend in the economic mm -hmm. hierarchy. Um, and that, that ascension doesn't necessarily have to do with education. It simply has to do with the possibility of becoming a business person or uh, being granted a, a status um, that comes with your background. Uh, I, in the, in the autobiography, I reflect on the fact that the moment I land in Mexico City now, or at the, at the point that I wrote the autobiography, automatically a Mexican will refer to me as patron, uh, like boss, uh, just because of the way I look, the way, the, the, because I'm coming from the outside. So the Mexican Jewish community quickly move upward socially and economically, um, really in the span of 20 or 30 years, uh, certainly in the span of a generation, there was a move from coming from poverty to being in the middle class like my family was, and uh, shortly after to becoming wealthy. Uh, and, and, and even uh, extremely wealthy in certain circles of, of the Mexican Jewish community. Uh, so there was, on the one hand, the sense of being welcomed by the, Mex by the country and the, the ambivalence that I was mentioning to you from within our own background, that we were there temporarily or accidentally, that that, uh, that we could have ended up in the United States if the quotas had been different, or in Argentina, or maybe in Israel. So that, that uh, everything was, as I, used, as I mentioned before, a lottery. Um, there was always a tacit form of antisemitism that was taking place. I was never a target of an attack, but uh, with some regularity, the, the focal point together with some friends of verbal harassment eh, of what the Jews, the Jews are taking, taking everybody's money or the Jews are Christ killers or the Jews are a cabal that is taking over the government and taking over the media. It's the regular tropes that you hear. In, at one point in particular, and, and I have written about it and I just finished a short story uh, connected with it. In my late teens, um, the, the situation, economic situation in Mexico was really precarious. Um, and the president at that time, uh, uh, Lopez Portillo, nationalized the bank industry, which was a, a, a major decision. And there was a state of fear and a state of uh, uncertainty in the country, he used a fear strategies in, in order to a, detract people from getting money out of the country and depositing it in the US mm -hmm. or in Switzerland or in the Cayman Islands or wherever it was that people could imagine at that time and threatened to make published a list, to make public a list of saca dollars. It, those that were taking their dollars out. And it was, it was deliberately sent out to the press that it, the list of about 100 families was prominently uh, represented by Jews. So at that time, uh, Richard, something happened in my own upbringing that as I look back is, uh, is really decisive. The Mexican Jewish community, uh, knew that it, it was very vulnerable and that should something happen, the police, neither the police nor the government would really defend it or protect it. So it, it created a, a, a militia a, of self-defense you know, to protect temples, to protect a, a prominent figures in an occasion to do some uh, operations that, had, that, that involved erasing graffiti or intimidating somebody who was writing anti-Semitic statements in the press. It was called Bitacon, 
uh, which in Hebrew means security. And I was invited to, to, to be part of it. And for a year, was part of it. Uh, so what, what, what was inside? And then, you know, when I left uh, Mexico and I left the, the entire past, didn't think much about it. But recently, with the, the rise of antisemitism in the United States, um, with the situation in Gaza, uh, with Israel, all that episode in my life has become more like, fresher. And, and I think about it more often. Right, right. Yeah, there, there are definitely organizations similar to that in, in some large metropolitan areas, in particular in New York City. Yeah. Uh, sort of self-defense yeah. groups. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that when you were 18, you uh, went to Israel. Was your intention to make Aliyah? It was to make Aliyah. Um, I think my intention at that point was to uh, solve the, the division in my heart between being Mexican and being Jewish. I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I thought that by going to Israel, I will I would cure that wound. Um, and I tried, uh, frankly, I don't know, you know, I was 18 and I was imagining what I could do with my future. Uh, I wanted to do Aliyah, but I wasn't married or I wasn't investing on anything or I didn't apply for a passport in Israel. Uh, but I didn't want to go back to Mexico. Um, that was for sure. And and uh, what I did was uh, imagine myself in Israel, teach myself the best Hebrew that I could. Um, and, and I realized then that uh, I was a diaspora Jew, that I, that I liked certain elements that I had been, that had been so difficult for me to tackle. And it is part of a, a two chapter kind of narrative in my life because that was in 1979, 1980. I did go back to Mexico after that year. I started undergraduate in Mexico. And again, for other, uh, re for reasons similar to the one that I told you, but a little later, uh, clear anti-Semitic events, confrontations, now at the, at the, at the university level, um, and a, a, a spirit of rebellion on my end that was rejecting all the Jewish culture that I had received, a Jewish education that I had received from my parents, had moved out of, of home, was, was moving in different uh, non-Jewish circles. I again sold everything, uh, dropped out of college and went to Israel for a long, an, another extended period of time. Uh, that time in a much more decisive way to make the Aliyah, kind of to test myself and say, if it didn't work two or two years ago, it will work right now. And again, reach the same conclusion that Israel was an admirable experiment that the Jews were doing in the second half of the 20th century, but that I prefer to see it from afar. Did you uh, serve on a, work at a kibbutz during this period of time? I was in two kibbutzim, in one in the north, uh, Tel Katsir, in the Kinneret, in the northern, next to the Golan Heights, and then spent a uh, time too in another kibbutz next to Yerushalayim, um, that, uh, to Jerusalem, um, that, uh, that was also wonderful. Then uh, lived in Haifa, uh, lived for a short period in Tel Aviv, but mostly in Jerusalem. So we, we share an important life experience and working on a kibbutz. You did that too? It's also on a, on a kibbutz near Beit Shan. Yeah. Kibbutz Kamadiyah. It was, yeah. I was there, for about, there. I was there for about 10 weeks. Yeah. It was uh, definitely a fascinating experience. And yeah. I went in with a lot of idealism and, and left with a certain amount of cynicism. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought about Aliyah. I, Ultimately, I don't know. I, maybe I'm just a diaspora Jew like, like you are. Yeah. Just somehow, psychologically, didn't didn't work for me. And yeah. yeah. Hard to articulate in some ways, in some ways why, but 
certainly a, a great experience. Yeah. So how would you say that your experience going to Israel on these, these two occasions, um, do, do, you, do you feel that it influenced your, yourself as, as a Jew? Do you feel that it uh, had an influence on your life going forward? Did, did it help you to figure out what you wanted to do going forward? Mm -hmm. um, it did. Um, I, 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 I realized after living in Israel on those two occasions that I was, uh, that, that the Jewish world that happened, I happened to be in was a bipolar world, that there was a, a center of gravity in Israel, in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, in, and there was a, another center of gravity that was in New York or in the United States, in that Mexico was a kind of peripheral uh, landscape um, between these two poles, between these two uh, centers. Um, I, by then it had become very clear to me, I'm talking about my, like being 20, 21, that I wanted to be a writer um, and that I wanted to explore Jewish topics in my writing. Um, I, it, it became also very evident to me that because of the nature of Hispanic society, uh, writing about Jewish topics was much more difficult than writing about Jewish topics in the United States, where Jews were more mainstream than Mexican Jews or Jews in Latin America. And of course, in Israel, where everything is, is, is kind of mixed. But in Israel, I understood too that it wasn't about writing Jewish topics, it was about writing Israeli topics. Uh, and, and there was a distinction to me uh, between the two. Um, and so I, I came back um, at the age of 20 or 21, utterly defeated. It was probably the most, the deepest, most shake, shaking period of my life. I came back to Mexico knowing that Israel was not for me, but I, I just couldn't see Mexico as my place either. And for, don't know, Richard, maybe several weeks, I, I don't have a clear recollection of how long. I, I remember how deep. Uh, I stayed in my bed in a kind of uh, deep depression, that uh, crying, and, and I hadn't, wasn't that I, there was, you know, I had been in love with a woman in Israel, but she had left. Um, it was more like, I don't know where I fit. I don't know who I am. I don't know if my life program, what I want to accomplish uh, is viable. Um, I, I had seen some Mexican Jewish writers write what looked to me very interesting but marginal type of writing. I did not want to be a pariah, but I did not want to be a polit politicized Jew, like an Israeli who has to be writing about the, the, the conflict with Arabs and, and et cetera. So I, um, you know, I had dropped out of college and uh, a number of people convinced me, you know, the worst you can do um, is simply to finish college, just kind of take the inertia that you had started two years ago, uh, see if you can uh, regain some credits that you left in the middle and, uh, and go back. I had no interest in new knowledge. I did not, I, I did not see a, a path for me. Uh, but I did that, uh, persuaded largely by my mother that that I that I should finish the college, and um, with my father also. My father kind of played an interesting trick with me. Um, he told me that um, he, as an actor, that it had been very difficult for him to find his own path because of the the moment where his father died and he had to help with, a, with that factory that I was telling you, uh, support my grandmother and his younger sister, etc. And my father drafted a little 
muck contract and said, you know, I'll pay for your education as long as you bring me, you declared a major that would, in times of trouble, allow you to make a living the way I didn't have a major, because my father didn't finish more than, than the elementary school. Mm -hmm. I said, sure, I'll do that, and, and ended up becoming, taking the psychology major, thinking that if, if I wanted to become a writer, psychology would be, and uh, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a good little trick because I managed to finish and I found more of a place for myself and you know, things, one thing went to another after that. Hmm. That's, it's a very interesting evolution that, that you're describing, including a, a dark night of the soul very dark, very, very kind of a, you know, Byron or that type of romantic poet. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. the body would not act and the soul right. was right. part right. of it. Right. So it sounds like you, you, you felt that Mexico was not going to be the place where you could realize your fullest potential. Is that a fair way to, absolutely. to say it? So in yeah. 1985, you moved yeah. to the U.S. Yeah. But was your intention to make that a, a permanent move or just to check it out, see where it went? Had you been accepted to Columbia at that point for graduate? I was, I was accepted at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Ah, okay. Point. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my hope was to uh, figure out any way possible to make it to the United States, study something a, a graduate school. A, I was also a newspaper correspondent for one of the dailies in Mexico. And a, I thought to myself, well, if Israel is not the option and Mexico is, is not the option, let me try the United States and see what happens. I, I, um, I admired the type of writing, Jewish writing that was coming out a, a, from the US at that time, Bello and Roth, and Malamud and Cynthia Ozick. Um, but it was a very distant aspect for me because they were all natives or one of them was Canadian that had moved to the, um, they had, um, Bello had the Yiddish in his past. So that I felt very close. I, I also admired Bashev Zinger. Um, and I said, you know, this, this is the best chance that I have and we'll see where it goes. How, how was your English at this point? <laughs> you was, will, that, was that a problem in terms of your transition? My English you? was absolutely atrocious and really incredibly limited. Um, and I look back and think, Oi, how, how did I do it? How did I write papers in English? Um, but you know, it's the immigrant mentality. You got to survive. You got to do. And I would do all sorts of crazy exercises to, that I would impose myself in order to, to, to learn English as quickly as possible. How is the transition culturally from, from Mexico to the US? It was uh, gut-wrenching. And as I look back, uh, Richard, that is, the, the parting of waters in my life. The moment I, I remember very concretely once driving with my father and brother from Mexico City to Cuernavaca, which is about 70 miles to see someone at the Moshe Skene, which is the, the, the retirement home for the elderly. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in the back and telling my father, I'm gonna to go to the United States. Like I, I had no option, no way. I'm going to go to the United States. My father had tried to come to the United States when he was young, and he lived in New York for nine months uh, studying theater. And um, he, he laughed, but in a, in a benign way. Try it. I'll, if I, I can't help you because I don't have money, but I support you emotionally. And uh, I started sending letters to people and uh, to institutions, and then... A, a teacher of mine a, recommended that I write to this rabbinical school, the Jewish Theological Seminary, about which I knew nothing. 
And the, I got a very hopeful letter back. And then one thing led to another. And they invited me to come in. Did you intend to become a rabbi? I never intended to become a rabbi when I moved to the United States. But while being at the school, I thought, shall I switch from the graduate school to the rabbinical school? And uh, I, I very consciously said no, but it, has, it was in my, the back of my mind. I, I, am, I think often, Richard, about how the role of the rabbi has changed in 2000 years from Rabbi Akiva to the present. And, and the, I, do not, I do not admire, though I have many close friends, what rabbis are asked to do today in, as, as leaders of communities, but I, I was attracted by the rabbinical tradition. Right, right. Yeah. Today, um, yeah, it's, there's there's a lot of how, how to put it. They're they're counseling of your your congregation. There is a lot of administrative work. Right. There, there is a certain amount of scholarship as well, uh, but a lot of litur obviously liturgical. Yeah. Things, um, yeah. It's that, that's a difficult. It's a difficult job. You you have to. You you serve at the whim of the congregation and. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be popular, but yet aloof in some ways. It's it's definitely a difficult. And and you walk on, on shell uh, on eggshells all the time, in the. You are, I mean, there, there's a lot that rabbis and synagogues have adopted from the, Christ, the Protestant and the, and the Catholic traditions, the format of the synagogue, the, the role of the rabbi. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, it was very interesting to be in a rabbinical school and to see sure. them sure. Uh, being educated, being formed, shaping their own characters. Sure. That was fascinating. Sure. Sure. Did it, did it uh, transform your identity as a Jew? Did it influence your identity as a Jew? It did in dramatic ways. Um, it showed me, you know, I had never been, I, I went to, uh, to, to Jewish school, Yiddish school, but um, it wasn't until I arrived to New York that I realized that uh, I could study Jewish culture in a more systematic way. And it was, the, the Jewish Theological Seminary was not uh, uh, intellectually, was not a, a, a powerful institution, it was very limited in many ways. But, but I was by then or self-taught uh, or resilient in, in, in just being in New York City, having the capacity and occasion to take classes in at Columbia, where I eventually moved to do my PhD, um, it gave me a, another perspective of who I was and what Jewish mm. culture was about. Mm. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about your experience as, as an immigrant, your, your feelings about immigrants. I saw a quote by you, and I, I hope it's an accurate quote. Tell me if it's not, but you're quoted as, as saying, I am and will always be a Mexican in the U.S. Yeah. So you live a lot longer, certainly at this time in the U.S. Yes. than Mexico. Um, but it, it sounds like perhaps being in Mexico was somehow a more important component of who you are. Uh, somehow being Mexican is um, a stronger, more representative of, of the essential Lance Dobbins. Did you comment on that? You know, the, the, I think that in a writer's life, maybe in, a, in any, any life, the, the early years are the seeds, the, the roots, the foundation um, that you go back to and on which you build who you are. Um, those 20 years, 25 years of my life that I spent in Mexico were formative, were essential, um, all the insecurities, all the dreams, uh, all the certainties, 
um, are in one way or another connected with them. Uh, being a, a member of a very, very small minority uh, defined me profoundly. I would have been a very different person had I grown up in the United States in a Jewish community that is mighty compared to what we Mexican Jews, uh, mighty culturally, mighty economically, mighty uh, uh, intellectually. Um, in Mexico, the, I, I was very aware of the fragility, the vulnerability, the transient nature of, of being Jewish, uh, the passing of values of one to another. Um, I don't think we had, I did, I, I'm, I'm a grandchild of those that went through the Holocaust. And I think that by osmosis, the guilt, the survivor's guilt, the, the feeling that um, you know, Jewish life can be erased at a moment's time from anywhere. Um, it's very ingrained in me. I, I, I am very grateful now to the United States, but I can also feel that this can be erased any minute, that, that Jewish life here is far less solid than many of my contemporary American-born friends, uh, I believe, think it is. Um, and I see myself, I saw myself as an outsider in Mexico. Um, I moved to Israel thinking that out, being an outsider was a handicap, realized that being an outsider is what makes Jews Jews. And then moved to the United States and, and remain an outsider here. Although my wife and my friends say, what kind of outsider are you that you're really at the center of things in so many ways? So it could be a figment of my imagination or, or simply that past that I am telling you. Right. It, it sounds that the experience of being an immigrant sort of embodies, represents this, this vulnerable, fragile, State of state of existence that you you seem to embrace in in a very positive way. Um, there, there's another quote that's attributed to you that I hope again is accurate. It's being an outsider is an integral part of me. Yeah. Uh, so I had the question. I, but there's one. Let me interrupt you just sure. for one second, sure. Richard. Sure. For me, the vision of being an immigrant, and I take this from the four grandparents that I, I descend uh, from uh, is that you have to prove yourself all the time because you came here and you didn't have the right to be here in the first place. I have the immigrant mentality that um, I, I did not have the language the way a native English speaker has the language. And so I have to learn it every day in, in it's kind of a convert's approach to things. It's like a convert to Judaism that maybe ends up knowing more about the religion because I have to learn all that. I, I live day to day with the feeling that I have to prove myself, that, that I have to, that I have to every day, and you will say, really, Ilan? That every day I have to reclaim the place that I, that I found for myself. Do you see that as a source of stress or as a source of, as a motivation, a, a goal, something to, to aspire to that I can't take anything for granted? I have to latter. continually be reinventing myself and, and proving myself. Absolutely, the latter. Though it does come with stress too. Though, but I, 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 don't, I don't think of the stress as, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not consumed or agonized by it. Mm -hmm. But it is part of that engine of, I have to do it. I have to prove it because I, I, it's, it's the immigrant, immigrant that has to say, um, you know, I, I, to this day, uh, Richard, I have the impression that again, at a moment's notice, because of whatever, it doesn't have to be an anti-Semitic shift, but that what I have been able to do can be taken away my house, 
my my what I've what I've written, uh, the 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 opportunity to teach that everything can disappear in a, at a at a moment's notice. And I, it's a bit of a I'm not a paranoid person. I'm not also a person who thinks that a gas chamber is waiting on the other side of the street. To me, all this is the immigrant who says, I, you know, I have to prove that this is, that, that this is worth, that I am worth what people think I'm worth. Right, right. I, there, there was a question that I wanted to ask you. I think you've perhaps already answered the question, which is, do you, do you see Jews as, as paradigmatic immigrants, paradigmatic outsiders who perhaps in Israel, you, you could say it's an exception, but but anywhere else in the world that there's, you're, you're living in a, in a state which can be changed in a heartbeat that yeah. what you have could be taken away based, based on history, certainly the history of the Jewish people. Sure. And perhaps we, we are living in a somewhat of fantasy to think that that can't happen in today's world as, as well. 100%. And I also, in, in, I, you put it, I couldn't have put it better. Uh, and I also feel that it, just as, as a, you made an exception, I, I, would have, I, sh I would have as well with Israel because of the circumstances that Israel has, I, I think that American Jews to whom I feel connected in part of, but, but still as an outsider, are very naive in essential ways of a, what the American Jewish experience is all about. Um, there's a triumphalist view of American Jews that we have reached the best imaginable diaspora ever in that from here on, it is only the, the, the management of democracy, so to speak, the, the excesses of democracy. But you know, the Berlin Jews thought something similar. Uh, and again, I'm not a catastrophist. I just don't think that you ever reach a point where the end of history has arrived. I think history goes on and there's, there's the ascent of lunatics like Trump uh, that just, just a little bit more uh, with a little bit more time could have done a worse damage than than they did. Do you, do you equate um, being an immigrant with being an outsider? Yes. Okay. You've written a lot about the immigrant experience and unborrowed words, certainly, and in, in, in a lot of the other things that, that you've written. I'm restless books yeah. dedicated the least in part on examining, focusing on the immigrant experience and right. the, the Jewish. Uh, for me, immigrants are, real, are really an engine of change. And I think Jews have been an engine of change in so many moments in history mm -hmm. because we have come from the outside and we're not compromised by the inside. And when we become compromised, the situation mm -hmm. It starts to be dangerous. I think immigrants, which are, you know, a, often portrayed as, as dangerous, are really forces of transformation in, in many ways psychologically because of that a, need that we have to prove ourselves, the renewal of society with new blood that comes. And, and I think that for me, being Jewish is being an immigrant, even when we're not, uh, having the view of an immigrant, uh, coming and having to teach yourself in acquiring the toolkit of, of, the, of the mainstream in order to uh, function, and function in a way that is just like everybody else, or almost like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I think that, that uh, the Talmud, uh, the Jewish literature in different moments, uh, scientific innovations, technological innovations that Jews have done, the, the, the high numbers in 
the Nobel Prize in, in this and that have much to do with this mentality of um, you acquire the tools, uh, you come from this lineage that has been in other places, and you prove yourself and then, then uh, society, change that period of society. So as Jews have become more affluent, perhaps, at least on the surface, more deeply embedded in society, in, in positions of, of power and influence, do you see this model that you're talking about changing, maybe changing dramatically? Look, that's a, that's a very, I think often about that, Richard. I, Jews have not been upward, like, upwardly mobile. Uh, and as, uh, as wealthy and as powerful as we are right now in a long time, but we have been before in Greek times, in Roman times, and certainly when before the destruction of the second temple, um, before the destruction of the first temple, I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't think that Jews and power um, and power um, is an equation that brings us down. I think that we have had power in different moments and we've known what to do with power. I just don't think, you know, we, we inherited from the 19th century this teleological ideologies that the end of time would come when there would be a Jewish nation, when everybody would share the same means, when there would be justice in the world. And every day we are shaped by those that kind of rhetoric, social justice, let's make America equal. It's a beautiful dream. I'm, I'm all for it, but I don't think it can come. I mean, there's something intrinsic in all of us that, that creates the haves and the have-nots, the powerful and the powerless. I don't think that we can create a, a messianic society on earth. Societies are always going to be unbalanced in one way or another. This is not to say that we shouldn't try to, to create them. So I, I feel on the one hand that it's an extraordinary moment in Jewish history, the one that, that, I'm, that I'm a witness and a participant in. Um, the, the, the flourishing of scholarship, uh, the spread of intellectual life, the capacity to travel the world in ways that Jews have not had. Jews have been really localized in different places. We, we, we're very mobile now. Um, all that is wonderful. It poses new challenges and uh, challenges that might, that might be very productive in, on some on some lines and, and, and uh, pervasive on others, but those are the challenges of history. Do you feel that there are certain basic ethical values, Torah, that, that, that Jews uh, have an obligation as Jews to press forward in society ideas of uh, equality, ideas of um, taking care of our neighbor, of, of kindness to strangers. There, there's a whole litany of ethical. I, yeah, I believe that our duty as Jews is to be ethical and to explore and to use our minds and hearts in the best possible way for those around us and for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I do believe we have fallen into a dangerous conundrum uh, that is kind of the liberal thinking of tikkun olam, that everything has to be social justice. I don't, I am all in favor of social justice, but I believe it is a recent, it is a recent concoction of Judaism. I don't believe that Maimonides believed in Tikkun Olam in the same way or that Rashi and Hillel. Uh, I think it's very much a, a legacy of Heschel and the civil rights movement and the, the very America that we've in it. Again, I, am, I, I consider myself a liberal Jew and believe that helping others is our responsibility. But 
it, but we have also fallen trap into this. Uh, I don't know what really it means to be chosen. Um, I think often about that. I don't think that we have to be teaching others how to live life. And our Jews often think that they, we often think that we do. And uh, though I think that we should help others, I think it's foolish to think that society is going to reach at any point a level of equality for everybody. I think that we live in a more violent world right now than in a long time. I mean, thinking of course the Holocaust, etc. cetera. Um, Steven Pinker at, at Harvard says that uh, violence has gone down. I don't believe it for a second. I think that it's a, it's a very volatile, very dangerous time. And I think the 21st century is likely to be more vicious and, and toxic than the, than the 20th. You've raised a lot of a lot of in, interesting points, and uh, it, it raises for me the question of where do you see uh, Judaism best exerting its influence on the world going forward? If if it's not specifically Tikkun Olam, I, I think for some Tikkun Olam, just a personal opinion that for some Tikkun Olam has been a replacement for Judaism in a larger sense. Sure. Yes, of course. Tikkun Olam is not insignificant, but oh, sure. How how do you how do you see? You, how do, you know, how do you, I'm sorry. For a long time, Richard, we did not see Judaism as having an impact on the world. We saw Judaism as having a survival a mechanism on us, on the Jewish community. I don't know if, or I don't think that a Judaism has the duty to have an impact on the world. I really don't. Although I, I, I think often about the world and it's, I'm very concerned about it. I don't think that we are a universalist religion uh, that wants to, I think that Christianity has that, uh, Islam has that. Judaism has been more into at least rabbinical Judaism. And, um, but I think that the moment in which we live right now is one where, we, where Jews think of themselves as universalists. Um, that's a, that's, that poses interesting questions for me. Right. Right. Going, going back to Genesis and, and God's promise to Abraham of uh, being a blessing to the nations, being a blessing to the world. How, how do you interpret that, being a blessing to the world? How, what does that mean to you? For me, um, it means that you, you live, it's like you teach by, by you, you, I don't only teach in the class, I, the, the line is escaping me right now, Richard, but um, you teach by who you are, by, by the things that you do outside the classroom too, by the human being that you are. Um, and, and I think that that gift that God, that God gives us of being uh, chosen, it has cost us enormously being chosen. And it's in, the, it's in the DNA of who we are. It's both an incredible responsibility and a, a, a condemnation, a, 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 a curse. I wouldn't give it away. I, as you know, because we have been together in the same classroom, have wrestled with maybe less so with the gift of being chosen than who it is that asks us to be chosen. The, the, the biblical God is a God that I both fear and feel that is a tyrant. Um, and so the obligation to be different, which I take very seriously, um, and the obligation to be a teaching by 
modeling ourselves is a, it's, it's not easily resolved. Yeah, to, to, to me, the concept of Jews as a chosen people raises the question, what, what does that mean to be chosen? Chosen for what? Yeah, sure. Um, that can be interpreted a lot of, a lot of different ways. Do you, is, is there some interpretation that you would put to that chosenness? I think it's a sense, it's a calling to be an example. Um, but not much more to into maybe to have an intimate dialogue all the time with God, hmm. to have a kind of direct line of communication with God hmm. that doesn't cease. And it could be seen as liturgical or simply a stream of consciousness that we have all the time. I think that that stream of consciousness is what makes us Jewish, hmm. that kind of a constant reflection. Are we here? Why are we here? What is this about, etc.? cetera? Um, but in the end, it comes to example. Um, it pains me, frankly, that in the Me Too movement age, uh, many of the excesses have been by men, Jewish men that have been infatuated with power in such a way uh, that that uh, have gone astray. Um, we've always paid a price. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do not think of a ghetto mentality, let's stay at home in order not to pay the price. Mm -hmm. The opposite, go out and experiment and, mm -hmm. and, and figure out what the place is and who you are. Um, it's that ethical approach. It's it's a, it's a duty also, uh, Richard, to be, to be married to the written page. I, for me, that connection with the written page, both as a reader and as a writer, I think is what makes me Jewish. I think Jews are readers with all the complication that comes. Even when they don't read that much, the fact that we have uh, a book as the center of our adoration, that we kiss it every Saturday when it comes down from the ark, that, uh, that we touch it so carefully with, with, the, with our prayer shawl or, or with a specific kind of hand, um, what a reference do we have for the page? And, dreaming of, of producing a page that is worthy of not only our contemporaries, but the future is, is, is a very worthy Jewish dream. Right. Right. I want to talk to you more about language, the importance of language, but just, just to go back to a point that you had made, which is this idea of, of colloquy with God. Um, do you feel that you find that conversation in liturgy, in being in a prayer service, or in, in some other setting? In both of them. I find that to be a polyphonic. The connection with God is sometimes through a poem, and it might not be by a Jew, a Jewish poet. It is in, in, in temple. It might be simply in walking uh, on being on an aisle in on a supermarket and looking at something and thinking rumble thoughts. Um, for me, that uh, colloquy, soliloquy, um, that ongoing dialogue is the, the, the defining Jewish factor, the, the factor that defines me as a Jew. And um, I don't limit it to Jewish texts because there's so much that can be Jewish in a text that is not overt. And because Jews are curious beyond their own mm. texts, they go outside, they read, they read out in order to read in. If I were to ask you the question that was raised with uh, Rabbi Hillel, which is in one sentence, what would you say? The essence of, of Torah, 
while standing on one foot. How, how would you respond to that? I would respond, I, I, wait, the question is, how would you respond to Hillel's or how would you summarize Judaism? How would you summarize Judaism if, if you had to do it standing on one foot? Yeah, I or, would say- Or Torah or both. Yeah, I would say that it, it is, it, standing on one foot, it is the act and art of reading one page and realizing that that page is a covenant that you have with the world outside and with yourself. Beautiful, beautiful. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the importance of language, the importance of the word that you have written so much about. You've written a number of books about linguistics, uh, Spanglish, Dictionary Days, uh, mm -hmm. Resurrecting Hebrew. And has, has this arisen, has this evolved to some extent by your, your Jewish background or by your multilingualism combination? Um, where, where does this fascination with the word come from? That fascination with the world comes from um, the, the Jewishness that I that I saw from from my ancestors. Um, would you ask me not long ago uh, about those first years in Mexico and how they had defined me? Um, I did not know that I was interested in language when I was in Mexico, even though it is the period where I learned most of the languages that I know right now, or I I got the infrastructure to be the person that I am right now. But it's only after I left home, and I always tell my students, if you really want to learn, leave home, whatever that means. Leave home because home is what it is when you look at it from, from the outside. You might go back again, but you have to look at it from the outside. It, I only realized the relevance of a, the word in language when I left home, I arrived to New York City and was in those subway cars listening to a, a babble of languages, uh, Spanish mm -hmm. forms that I had never heard in my life. I thought I knew Spanish, but the Puerto Rican Spanish, the New Yorkian, the, the Dominican, the Cuban, the, the, the Mexican that of, of Mexicans that had been in New York before me. It, then the Russian and the Yiddish and the English and the French and all the, the Caribbean words, it was it was just extraordinary. And it made me, you know, I had come to New York with the conviction that I wasn't going to be a pariah and that I needed to learn the language. But immediately the question was, what language? Who is speaking English in New York? And how is English being spoken in New York? How, at one point do you do you enter? And I became very interested in. In, in, in immigrants adopting and adapting the language all the time, and we Jews playing a crucial role as translators and as speakers in, in different moments. In the Orthodox butchering Yiddish, but keeping Yiddish alive at the same time. In, and then it was at, at the, at the, at, in the years of the seminary that I discovered Ludwig Wittgenstein. And for me, that was a, a, a moment of revelation. Uh, his reflections on how the world really is the language that we have to describe it, um, it opened up a, a whole new vista for me. Um, it, it, it was a, a, a very decisive moment that pushed me to think things of my past and of my present in different ways. Well, as, as the repository of history, the repository of knowledge, um, it's a way that we can commune with the past, we can, com we can communicate with uh, our contemporaries. The power of language is, is undeniable. And on, in, my, in my own view, Richard, what we have as Jews in the end is words. Hmm. The words that, that we got from Mount Sinai, the words of God, mm. our own words, the words that we have produced, words. In the end, no material 
richness, a possessions. You know, you go back to where you come from with nothing. But the words are are the only things that you had here, and uh, what you did with them. What what you're talking about reminds me of of your the, the Yiddish uh, animated short, Silence of Professor. Tom. <laughs> yes. I, I was I was really fascinated by that. It, it it resonated a lot. This emphasis on the power of words. There's a, uh, a quote that that I want to uh, repeat. The the only way to overcome death is through words. Yeah. Is is there something autobiographical going on there? Absolutely. Going on there. I I think that it's the you know I think Richard that my father was in the best of all arts theater. Theater has this capacity of living in the present, in an incredible present. A theater is always different every time you perform the same play. The rest of us artists uh, deal with art in different ways. And for me, um, writing is a futile attempt to overcome death. You never overcome death. You're gonna die just like everybody else. But you entertain yourself with the thought that maybe something, however, minor, it might be left and somebody at some point will read it and be affected by it. And you strive to create as solid a page or a sentence or a paragraph as you can um, and feel that if you really are in that page, uh, there was some worth in that day of your life, but it's all, it's all mm -hmm. you. I'm sorry to agree to you about the futility. I, it may seem futile at, at times, but I, I believe there is lasting value in, in what you write, and what you communicate with others. I, I truly believe that. Yeah. Uh, there, there's another question about Professor Tasla that I wanted to broach with you, which is he had a obviously had a, a very tragic accident, which uh, which caused him uh, a lot of a lot of uh, pain and, and, and agony. And, uh, but eventually he's able to come to some degree of recovery and one of his students oh, yeah. visits him. Professor Tazla sees, sees, let, sees uh, numbers on his forehead. Yeah. And as the student is speaking, the, num the letters decline. Right. It's, it's as if there's a limited number of words that one has in life. And yeah. each time you say a word, this this number goes down. Yeah, is that something that I'd be interested in your your thoughts on that concept that we seem to have a limited number of words in this life? I am absolutely convinced of that. I believe that all of us are born with uh, a number unknowledgeable to us, but knowledgeable to the divine of the amount of words that we'll be able to utter through our life. Mm. Um, and th th living life is a race to the finish, to zero, because it's in, in you're given this bank of words and you use them. Um, and when you die, the last word is, just before you die, the last word is uttered. And for me, that is both fatalistic, this is what we have, and extraordinarily promising because this is what we have. We have all these words that we can do something with. Uh, the question is not how many words we have, it's a finite number. We will never know it, but it's a finite number. Um, the question is what you do with those words how you turn. Yeah, that's, that's a very beautiful statement. And if, if you would excuse me, because I, I have to quote Frost. <laughs> that's a given. That's please a given. do, please do, please that, do. That, that's a given. Uh, <laughs> you know, with, with the oven bird, um, yeah. one of his beautiful poems, I don't want to quote the whole thing because it would take too long, but, but the poem ends, he talks about the flowers going away and the petals of the flowers going away 
um, this diminishment, this diminution that's taking place in the world. And then he ends with uh, the oven bird says, um, the, the question that he, he says in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. It was one of the more profound statements, I think, that for us me, oh. as we go through life, we may think of ourselves as immortal, but we're dealing with a diminished thing every day. Absolutely. Maybe in some ways the world is also a diminished thing. Yeah. What do we do with it? That's the question that we have to continually ask ourselves. Yeah. What yeah. to make I, of a diminished thing? What we do? That's that's. It's just beautiful. And in 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 the case that I was trying to um, explain, it is the diminishment that can serve as a platform for insight and for a lasting word that would that would express the conviction that you have at that particular moment. Mm. Um, it's it's maybe life, Richard, is the capacity to catch the words at the right moment and do something mm. with them that will allow them to outlast that mm. moment. Um, Yeah, there's there is a great short story writer, a uh, Israeli short story story writer, who talked about catching the angel by the tail. That you have the, even essent yeah. thing that you're, you're as a writer that that's yes. described as his writing model. He's yeah. trying to this angel by the tail. Yes, I love the image. It was a wonderful image. I, I had a question for you about. Uh, language and it, it's something that troubles me personally and I'd be very interested in, in your thoughts on this subject. If you go back to Through the Looking Glass, Humpty Dumpty says, and I quote, when I use a word, it means exactly what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. And of course, in, in 1984, you have the state coming out with these slogans that uh, freedom is slavery, war is peace. They, they turn language on its head. And it just seems to me in the modern world that language is sometimes used more to obfuscate than to illuminate, that it's used to manipulate, to achieve some purpose. Really over and above uh, any concern for what the language actually means. And an example of what I'm thinking about is the recent Human Rights Watch report on uh, Israel, which they admittedly come up with their own definition of apartheid. And then they accuse Israel of apartheid based on their definition of apartheid. So I would be very interested in, in your thoughts on this manipulation, what I see as manipulation, exploitation of, of language in a way that is very troubling to me. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful question or reflection, uh, Richard. And I would, uh, I would approach it from several angles. Um, to me, language, is never a static bank of words. Sure. Um, it, it changes in number. It, for instance, I, I often ponder, are there more words uh, in one language than in the other? Does English have more words than French or uh, Portuguese or Spanish, etc.? And if so, does that mean that an English speaker has more opportunities or more of a capacity to describe the world because there are more words in it. Yeah. Or in the end, it, having more words in a language doesn't mean much because you use the same 100,000 words that you have used uh, replacing a few uh, because they keep on circulating. And uh, the, the other 900,000 never really affect you. But also, the, what, what intrigues me about language is that words are 
uh, evanescent. They are in they are in constant change. A, a kaleidoscope, depending on how you see them, they will mean something different. When I arrived to this country, the word bad, um, it meant bad. And the word bad today could be just- It's uh, good. <laughs> good. It's exactly. And this is what, just one of the most basic words, right? Um, or it intrigues me that the word fuck was exiled from, from the, Merriam-Webster and OED because neither dictionary would accept it as legitimate when it's one of the most versatile words in the English language. It can be an adverb, it can be a noun, it can be an adjective, etc., an exclamation. Um, so I I think the the, the definition of words um, is a, is is a is a is a fascinating phenomenon. Who gets to define words and what do words mean? in what way are definitions more changeable than the words themselves? If you go, for instance, to the word Jew in the, in the English dictionary, starting in the 1500s to the present, you'll get a variety of definitions that go from a, a satanic figure, a, a proselytizer of the faith of Moses that is trying to achieve this or that, to the current definition, who, you know, the person that practices Judaism, etc. So definitions change as much as words. I'm, I'm not surprised that the word Holocaust it can be so contested and that people would not want others to use the word Holocaust, but they don't mind if they use the word genocide because genocide has different meanings and it can be, Holocaust is our word. Genocide can be a word for others too. I have seen, you have seen uh, opinion pieces in different newspapers of Jewish writers who say the word Holocaust, Shoah is sacrosanct and let not, let's not use it for anything else. I can see very clearly how the, the, the word apartheid can be uh, reconfigured, readapted to understand things. Um, it, it, in, to me, in the end, what is happening in the Arab, in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, is not only a power struggle about land, but it's a power struggle about narratives and the languages that are used in those narratives. And it's it's a power struggle between those that are participating in the conflict and those that those that are outside the conflict. Um, it's it's a it's it's agonizing to me what happens in Israel. Um, it's agonizing how others perceive what is happening in, in Israel. Um, it's agonizing too that uh, we as Jews have come barely seventy five years after the Second World War to this moment in history that it that kind of inverts certain paradigms. Uh, having been uh, almost having been taken to the gas chambers as sheep, as cattle. Uh, now we have guns and now we have, we have uh, the capacity to uh, defend ourselves. Um, it, uh, it's, we inserted ourselves as we often do. We, we you know, being Jewish in, in history is about inserting yourself right in the middle of the, the narrative, whatever narrative is happening at that time. Jews are prominent actors. Uh, just, just, we're always there, not in a supporting role, in a, in a prominent role. And it's happening again. I, I, don't, I don't think that words have static definitions. I think that the definitions change. Um, and the word, the word apartheid, does, does not start and end in South Africa. This is not to say that I believe that what's happening in Israel is, a, is apartheid, but that the, the use of the word is being manipulated the way we can also manipulate the word Holocaust. Hmm. Sounds like you're taking a very non-judgmental uh, I, I would say both judgmental and non-judgmental. Okay. I'm totally agonizing the situation that is happening in Israel right. and, and uh, infuriated, but also uh, thankful that, that Israel exists 
and that it has to defend itself and that it has a sovereignty of a, of a contemporary nation, that, just like any other nation needs to be protected. Could you say more about what you mean by finding the situation in, in Israel agonizing? Yeah, I, I um, look, uh, Richard, the, the story of Zionism is uh, a complicated story that goes back to the messianic elements of uh, the Bible, um, particularly the Davidic period, uh, the destruction of the temples, and more than anything, the um, views of progress of the 19th century. Zionism is a very complicated um, ideology that has changed over time. Um, it's, th there are crucial mistakes that uh, the founders of Israel made in the birth of Israel of not acknowledging those that were already there. Um, maybe it was the only way to, 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 do the, to do what they needed to do. Maybe a different story could have been uh, told by acknowledging already that this mm -hmm. land were not empty, that there were that there were people living in them, and that it's 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 a bit like like what happened in Latin America when the Spaniards arrived. I mean, indigenous people, they, who cares about them? They, they, we're going to build it. So it's complicated, but the world the histories are complicated. They are they are the Arabs are as complicated as we are. I'm not putting the Palestinians in any way as innocent people. Uh, they have. Uh, to foolishly not taking it, the, the many opportunities that they have had uh, in order to create lasting peace or a possibility of just a normal life. So it's an incredibly tragic situation. You know, Latin America, Richard, has the largest Palestinian diaspora outside of the Middle East. I didn't realize that. Yeah, Chile, Argentina, to a lesser extent, Mexico. So some of us grew up with, uh, many of them are, are Christian Palestinians, mm -hmm. uh, not, not Muslim Palestinians, uh, with that diaspora. And, and it, it has gone, it, in some ways, it has become a Jewish diaspora. The, the Palestinians have become the Jews in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. if, if you had the power to, to do it, I'm not saying you do, but if, if you had this ultimate power, how would you... I have no idea. You're, I, you're, I, you're, you're optimal. Nothing is going to be perfect. Yeah, Richard, I'm not. I am. I'm not prescriptive. You know. I, also, I love dictionaries because some of them can be prescriptive and other descriptive. I love descriptive dictionaries. I don't love prescriptive dictionaries. Let politicians be prescriptive. We writers are descriptive. <laughs> We won't, we won't solve the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And it's certainly not. <laughs> OK. I, 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 again, appreciate your, your patience. I just have a couple more areas that I'd like to sure. talk to you about, one of which is drama. Uh, I mean, obviously, you, you wrote the, uh, the, the story for the silence of Professor Tasla. Uh, your father was, was a very well-known actor in, in Mexico. And I should interject that. I have a son-in-law who grew up in Mexico City. Oh. And yeah, his family me. still lives in Mexico City, in fact. And I, I mentioned your father to him, and he was very familiar with your father, in particular, yeah. certain commercial. Yes, yeah, sure, <laughs> of course. My very father was famous. A, yes. Life, Boy, Life Boy Soap. Yes, of course. I'm like, that is one of, one, yes. of, one of the most famous commercials of the period. <laughs> right. And I understand your mother taught theater. Is that correct? My mother taught theater too. Sure, oh, she's I, a psychologist and, and who taught theater. Right. You wrote the oven. You performed yeah. the oven. Yeah. To to uh, pretty good reviews. I uh, <laughs> consider acting as as a career or is being a professor acting. Yes, the latter. How has how has drama affected your scholarship or your way of life? I am, I mean, I find theater a, a magical phenomenon in a religious phenomenon, uh, 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 Richard. I find what happens on a stage 
and an audience that surrenders its its uh, its day to day life enters this darkness in the auditorium and it agrees to see something on, on stage that is not real. Um, it's make believe for two hours and uh, suspend life. In those two hours, uh, it's as it's it's the theater of the mind. Uh, it's as if you were dreaming. I find this so intricate, so inspiring, so extraordinary. Um, and I, 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 I think of actors as sometimes as spies. I think you might have been in spies and imposters yes. and and, and people with, with mental illness, uh, but also having the enviable capacity to uh, be on vacation from themselves that many of us don't have. Um, I find of all the writers that I know, the one that I can't stop going back to Shakespeare, and, and it's, a, it's a mystery to me, and it's a mystery to many. Um, so drama is, was at, at my birth, so to speak, with my father. Um, it's a it's a late motif that runs through. Uh, even in uh, many short stories, there's a moment. Of, in my short stories, there's a moment in which a character kind of questions if this is a short story or if everything is not being acted in some particular way. Um, I feel that we all live in a stage that that, that, that God is the great dramaturg that is putting all this together. Um, so I would think, I, I find it really interesting that because of the, among other reasons, because of the prohibition against the idols, Jews did not have theater until the late 18th century, the 19th century. And today they are at the heart of the theater scene just about everywhere in the world and have won Nobel Prizes for this and many other prizes. Uh, we, we know how to make believe. I think Jews know how to make believe. Um, and so I, I, I find theater drama uh, a subject for philosophical inquiry. Um, uh, I have this desire to do more theater, uh, to write more theater. I think that even when I'm not writing theater, I'm, I'm doing theater in some ways and teaching is theater. Yeah. Do you prefer live theater? Movies, uh, any kind of live theater, live theater. I, mean, I, could, like, I, I love movies. Yeah. I get tired with the Netflix series because they go on from, like, they go on for so many episodes. Mm -hmm. I can't spend my life for that for that long. And my and Alison yeah. loves to say, "Let's watch this this series and this this season." And I can sometimes do it, but not many. But I, mm -hmm. I will do anything. I will stop at anything to go and see a good play at mm -hmm. any point. Mm -hmm. Give yeah. up yeah. Uh, uh, whatever important thing is mm -hmm. happening to go mm -hmm. see a good play. There's a lot to be said for living in an alternative universe for a while. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I would say that reading fiction, especially science fiction, but any kind of fiction, in a sense, you're living in that Absolutely. Sure. universe. Yeah. The make believe. I, yeah, yeah. I I had one other, I would say, sort of heavy question, serious question for you, which is uh, there's obviously a disturbing trend toward increasing anti-Semitism in the US and the world. And um, disturbingly also in a uh, university setting. Sure. The model, I think, has always been that to, to fight anti-Semitism, we need to educate people. We need to make people aware of the history of the Jewish people and make, make people aware of the dangers of anti-Semitism. And, and yet it hasn't seemed to work on the academic side. Right. Um, the model just is, is not, this doesn't seem applicable in some ways. Uh, how do you see this situation of, what, what are your thoughts on anti-Semitism, in particular in, in academia? In academia. Um, I, 
I believe that antisemitism, um, Richard, is a constant in history. And though I do not subscribe to the thought proposed by Jean Paul Sartre that uh, anti Semites need Jews as much as Jews need anti Semites, I believe, because of my own background, that um, we generate this discomfort in others because of some of the things that you and I have talked about being outsiders being so-called chosen, uh, excelling in various fields and disciplines. And that discomfort is, is, is not going to disappear. It comes with a ticket. Mm -hmm. um, this is, of course, not to say that you take it for granted and just turn your eyes in the opposite direction and continue life. You have to uh, educate people and, and uh, try to uh, ameliorate it. And that's what uh, the fight against antisemitism is. But I, I think that antisemitism being a constant has moments of exacerbation in with tragic outcomes like the Holocaust or like the Khmelnytsky massacres and, or, or has moments of more uh, tranquility like we have experienced in the United States um, maybe from the 50s to the 90s or, or, or so. Um, it, it will come back. Uh, we, sh we should be alert. We, we should be prepared and we should fight it before. Um, the, the academic milieu is a very sneaky and slick uh, environment where uh, insecurity prevails. It, many insecure people live in the academic world and uh, use it as a shield to expound all sorts of hatred and, and misinformation, but pretend that because they are in academia, they are more educated than any, anybody else. And so this is not misinformation. This is not fake news, etc. cetera. Um, there's a lot of uh, posing. Uh, there's a lot of tribalism in academia. Uh, academia is a, is a very dangerous environment as I see it. And I, uh, one of the biggest problems is that academics are always thinking of educating others, but never allowing others to educate us. Uh, as if, um, you know, we're beyond education. We have already arrived and we are in charge of being the teachers, never the students, which is a, a, a syllogism. It's, it's a totally false statement. Um, the rise of antisemitism, you know, antisemitism has gone through a different ideological waves. The, the antisemitism that comes from the uh, from the church, antisemitism in of the 19th century that is connected with a, well, it goes from the 17th century that has to do with capital, Jews not as Christ killers, but Jews as moneylenders and Etc. And then after the creation of the Jewish state, particularly after the six, uh, the war, and then the, the, the Yom Kippur war, Zionism and, and, and uh, anti Semitism, anti Zionism and anti capitalism, anti Semitism being one connected with the other. That's where we're right now, but there's a mix. It's not only that Jews are, because they are Jews, they are supporters of the state of Israel, but Jews, because they are Jews, they are also Christ killers and they are also this or that. And, and there's different antisemitisms and different, you know, Muslim antisemitism is different from French antisemitism, from British antisemitism, and so on. I, I think that academia is really a dangerous place in that sense. And I, I think we're only seeing incipient. Um, elements that are likely to become uglier there um, because of the, the, the power that, the, the false power that academics think to have, think they, they have. And also because the prominent role that Jews play in academia. So there's a, there's a way of not attacking your peers that are Jewish, but attacking Israel or attacking Jews outside indirectly kind of mentioning, oh, no, no, I love you. You, my Jewish friend, you're nothing like them. You, I would never be attacking you. 
you know, the hypo hypocrisy. So it's um, being inside, having been inside for 30 years, almost 30 years, oy, 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 it's a, it's a dangerous place. Do you have any thoughts about possible ways of combating anti-Semitism in academia or, or elsewhere? I think that there are crucial efforts that need to be made um, immediately. Uh, the anti-Semitism of the left now is probably more dangerous than the anti-Semitism of the right. And I know the anti-Semitism of the right is right. dangerous. Um, I am very worried about the anti-Semitism of the left. It's, it's, it uses a, this false premises that are, that are noxious, a, very toxic. Um, I think that it has to do with a, administrators and people in positions of power within academia taking stands that are more than simply another declaration that we're against what is happening in Israel, et cetera. That you don't know the amount of times a week that passes through in front of me. Would you sign this against what is happening in Gaza? Or were you saying, I mean, another one, really? What, what does, is that gonna, I think administrators who themselves are very vulnerable and then uh, tenure professors and, and others, the politics of identity in academia are very dangerous and connected with anti-Semitic and anti uh, other forms of hatred. Yeah, there's there's mm -hmm. a lot to think about mm -hmm. here and to act. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Again, I, I appreciate your, your time. I just have a few sort of personal questions. I hope you don't mind. Sure. <laughs> Go okay. ahead. Just, just to wrap up, uh, you, recently, you recently turned 60, which is yes. a big milestone in life. Um, would you be comfortable sharing any ideas you might have on your on goals, projects, uh, going forward changes in your life going forward from the age of 60? Richard, you have asked all the questions. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, it's good to turn 60. I wouldn't want to be young again. Um, I have a, a lot of things that I want to do before my, the end of my days, a, a lot of things that I want to write, a lot of a possible a, kind of reaching out to other, a, like theater again, a, the movies, a, a writing fiction again a, in ways that I've done different moments of my life. I'm writing right now a collection of stories. A, that uh, is inspired by different episodes of the Talmud. And uh, that's gonna be one of the <coughs> topics of my, of, that I'm gonna be devoting myself to in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I feel that I, there's a lot that I, that I wanna do yeah. in my space. Uh, I feel that finally, um, I don't have to struggle with words feel that now it's time or concentration or whatever other field, but it used to be, do, do I have all the words that I need to say this? I feel that the words are there. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be able to use them. Um, I, I feel it's very important to me to open doors to young people and to, to let them feel how savvy and passionate and intelligent they are and that they have a role to play and that there's a continuity between the past and the future. And I never thought I, in my youth that I would be a teacher and I, I, I love being a teacher right now and I take it very seriously. Um, and I, I, I like, I want surprise. I want the, the surprise of uh, being restless in, in going in different directions uh, in the 60s and 70s. So, okay. So, yeah. re re restless books uh, says it all for you. It does. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to make a comment on what you said about uh, your relationship with students. And, and in my experience in auditing your classes, you very much emphasize that empowerment of the students. Mm -hmm. trying to bring them out and to encourage them to engage in critical thinking, to challenge them, but, but to, to do that in a very respectful, uh, very encouraging way. 
Well, I'm glad that you're saying that. It means a lot. So, okay. uh, very, very, very uh, well done in terms of how you, how you teach the kids. Um, so you do a lot of reading for restless books. I'm sure you do reading for your classes that you teach at Amherst College, and I, I'm sure for your scholarship generally. What do you read in your free time? What do you read for fun? For fun, I read a lot of novels. I read um, graphic novels. I read uh, uh, stuff that kind of comes out of the out of nowhere and people suggest. Right. Uh, I love to be surprised by a new novel that some that all of a sudden yes. was published that, that I didn't know anything about that writer. Uh, I love to discover. Uh, sometimes wonder in the when before the pandemic uh, through the stacks of Frost Library in 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 C what other books are next to the ones that I've already taken out? And uh, why didn't I stop there before? So there's a there's a constant desire to, but you know, people send me a lot of stuff too, Richard, and I love when they do in, in the covers of paper. And it sounds like you have a very a very wide range of very wide range of reading. I, I like that, yeah. To say the least. Which is good. That, that's that's good. I uh, not not to be personal, but I was at the University of Rochester Graduate School, and when I left the graduate school, and before I started law school, I worked at the University of Rochester Library, which was yeah. amazing, amazing facility. And one of the things I did was shelf reading. You would make sure everything was in order. And yeah. the problem was, I would see a book, and I want to read that book. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Is anybody around? Can I <laughs> can I snatch a few minutes of reading? Exactly. Not the way I should like perform in that job. <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there's so much to read, so little time, as they say. Exactly, exactly. What, one other question, one final question, which is, you don't have a lot of spare time, I'm sure, but when you do have free time, how do you like to unwind and I don't, just, just recharge your batteries? How, how do you do that? I love spending time with friends. I love going and sitting sometimes for three hours uh, at lunch or dinner with friends. I love taking long walks with, with, the, with the former students or friends or, or, or my kids. I love sitting in the third floor, turning all the lights off, not falling asleep and just closing my eyes. Mm. And, and there are books around, but I don't open them. Mm. Just feel the, the floor, feel what is happening and let, let the, the nothingness come into my mind. That's very relaxing. And I love to watch movies. I love mm. a good movie. Mm. Um, it's a, it's, I, I've been a, my father introduced me to cinema early on and it's one of the greatest pleasures. But going back to what I, the way I started, I think one of the greatest um, aspects of life is friendship, truly. And I love having friends that go back 40 years, 50 years. Um, many of my pieces, I send them to, to them first to see what they think. Mm -hmm. I love, I love just reconnecting with them. I love new friends. I, um, my wife says I'm too social, and, and, but I love that part. <laughs> so, living during the pandemic must have been must have been difficult. It was difficult, but I but Zoom was uh, the the uh, a medicine. Right, right. Not like being in person, though. Not like being in person. Yeah, yeah. We'll see each other in person again. There's nothing. There's nothing quite like that. But yes, I. I what you say about friendship resonates very much with me. It's it's such an essential oh, of who you are and how you relate to the world. Absolutely. And I, it, I, yeah. I can't I can't thank you enough for your time, for your for your wisdom. It, the it, conversation it, has been it, wonderful, it's wonderful, it's delightful. really Absolutely. delightful. I appreciate all the time, the 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 clarity. And just the friendship too that we have developed over, over these years. Uh, looking forward to more 
let me know how things go and uh, we'll see each other again. I will. I, I have to end this by just saying lehitraot. <laughs> lehitraot, shalom. Shalom. <laughs> Muchas gracias, todaraba. Todaraba, thanks to you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care, Alan. <laughs>